Hey, it's Vanessa the Crafty Gemini and welcome to Whip Wednesday episode number 113. Today I'm going to be doing a demo and sharing some more tips and tricks like I always do with y'all about how to make a quilted, this is going to be bigger than the pot holder we've done recently, so more like a placemat or a hot pad or a trivet or something like that. Especially now with the holidays coming up, if everybody's entertaining or hosting potlucks, this is going to come in really handy. But let's make sure that all the technology stuff is on our side today. I have to have my screen over on this side today. So, oh, thank you, Glenda. She says, I can hear you. Awesome. I was about to say, if you can see me and hear me, let me know where you're tuning in from in the chat box below. I'm coming to y'all from my home crafting studio here in North Central Florida, where the weather is cooling off. We had some rain finally, and now it's starting to cool off. So last night, I think it dropped into the low 40s and it's in the 60s or so today. Thank you, Tracy. She says, hair looks great. I haven't blow dried my hair in over a year, but when the weather cools off and it dries off a little bit, it's the perfect time <laughs> to blow dry my hair because it actually will stay and won't get super frizzy. Okay, Janice says, hello neighbor from So Chilly Bradenton. Awesome, hello my fellow Floridians. We have Arlene in the house tuning in from California. We have a couple of y'all in Florida here. Let's see who else we have. Oh, hi, Mari's tuning in from South Wales in the UK. And we have Mena tuning in from Oklahoma. Okay, sounds good. Awesome. So let's go ahead and get started. And I will start off by saying this is episode 113. If you go back and watch episode 111, I showed you how I like to do my mitered corners uh, for just quilting cotton fabric. So it's an easy way to make fabric napkins. And of course, I also have standalone separate free tutorials that you can watch on these techniques on the Crafty Gemini YouTube channel. Okay. Then on last week's episode, that was number 112, we talked about, and I showed how to make a quick quilted uh, pot holder with uh, a technique that Similar to kind of how we fold up the mitered corners, we use the backing fabric to bring it to the front to finish off kind of like a faux binding look without having to deal with those pesky binding strips that I love, but I know so many of you out there do not. <laughs> so this is the example of the table runner. And let's go ahead and give everybody my over the shoulder camera shot here because I did mention in last week's episode that I was going to film a standalone separate tutorial for y'all and it went up last night. So I think... It only, did it go up yesterday or the day before? I think it went up the day before yesterday and it had a couple thousand views the next morning and I thought, oh, maybe it's not going to be that popular. And then this morning I woke up and it had like over 21,000 views. So thank you. I'm glad that y'all are enjoying that video. Feel free to share it with your friends who are looking for quick little holiday gifts that they can whip up, as well as if you're teaching anyone, a new beginner, a teen, a child, how to sew, these are some fun projects to make. So you end up having one fabric like this, and don't mind, this is the one we talked about last week that I used, I put the loop on the bottom corner, it should have been up here, and then with y'all's help, right? Last week we made the right one. When I'm using a directional print, I put the loop up here. We have a smaller chunk of fabric that ends up being kind of like the front focal fabric. And then the background fabric is what also wraps around to the front and creates that nice framing that we get without needing to fuss with binding strips, okay? So similar to this, and I know I got a couple of questions about this in uh, the comments, I think, of the YouTube video, and I know my friend Carla, who was tuning in on one of our last live Zooms for my recent bag club that just ended, and she was saying that she was gonna miter the corners too because she doesn't like the bulk in the corners. So I wanted to take the time today in this episode to talk a little bit about how to use these techniques to make a bigger version, right? Because it's kind of the same thing. We're using that polytherm heat reflective fleece to reflect the heat back onto the source of whatever you're putting on top. And so then you can decide if you're making it this big as a little coaster to put a hot mug on and protect your table or counter surface. If you go a little bit bigger, you end up making a pot holder or a little trivet. And if you go even bigger, like the one that I have here, this ends up making a nice placemat. Or if you are attending a holiday party or a potluck type of thing, you can set a hot casserole dish on this and still protect protect your surface while reflecting the heat from the warm casserole dish or pie dish or whatever back onto the source to help keep it a little bit warmer, right? As it sits. So let's talk about what we did here. And of course, this one is almost done already. And so I wanted to finish up to show you how to miter the corners now. So on these ones, we've talked about using the backing fabric to fold it and fold it again. And we basically just fold and fold on the corners so it gets a little bit bulky. And if you want to kind of follow along step by step with these techniques, like I mentioned earlier, make sure you watch Whip Wednesday episodes 111 and 112. Okay. So now 
Yes, Mel says right here in the chat, I'm thinking we can do the corners just like you do on the napkins. And so that's exactly what I want to show you how to do it when you have a smaller sandwich that's quite bulky on top, okay? So if you're wanting to make it kind of this size, this is more of a placemat or a hot pad like I mentioned, I'll go over the dimensions that I used. This top fabric, which is similar to what we have fo uh, focused here, right? Like this directional print. I cut this one to uh, 14 inches by 19 inches. Okay, then I cut a matching piece of that Bozal Polytherm Heat Reflective Fleece, this stuff. And remember, I'll include a link in the description box below and in the caption as well, so you can order it from our shop. We've sold out twice already. We restocked and we're still running low. So I set it so that even if we do sell out today, you'll still be able to order it and have it on back order because I have my next order on its way to us soon, okay? So this is a Polytherm Heat Reflective Fleece. You can see it's shiny on one side. And so based on the instructions that come with this product, we wanna have the shiny side side backing basically behind the wrong side of whatever the fabric you expect to put the hot item on okay the other side is a little bit more matte and it just looks like a puffy you know lightweight uh, fleece or a polyester batting okay so on this product at least different companies make different ones so make sure that you read the instructions on that okay let's see um, I'm making sure I'm not missing anything in the chat okay so let's move on so I said the top piece here was 14 by 19, so 14 this way, 19 this way. Then I cut a matching piece of that polytherm heat reflective fleece. And then I went ahead and added just one layer of 100% cotton batting behind it just to give it another, you know, extra little support and another layer to protect whatever surface I put it on. I could have easily used two layers of the polytherm heat reflective fleece like I recommend you do on these ones. We use two layers on this one. On this little sample here, I only used one because it's going to be for instructional purposes. But I just put a cotton batting layer behind here because this cotton batting is more affordable than the polytherm fleece. So if I want to make multiple items, I rather use one and one, you know, instead of using two, especially since this is so big of the polytherm. Now, Behind that, the back fabric that you can see is both going to be the backing as well as what wraps around the front to give us a nice finished binding here. That piece was cut two inches bigger. So I said this front piece was 14 by 19. This one, the background fabric, I cut 16 by 21. Okay, so that should give you a good start. Now, if you remember this from episode 111 and from a tutorial that I posted on my YouTube channel, ages ago, maybe a de almost a decade ago, I like to use manila folder scraps and I draw lines at whatever the increment is that I want to fold it over to make this like a little hem template. So this blue line here is one inch and y'all can see that. And then the other line is half of an inch. So I went in and folded, you can fold at one inch first and press it with your iron. Then you can fold it at half of an inch, okay? So you basically wanna have two folds here, and this is the same technique that I use to miter the napkins. And so I went ahead and already glue basted all the other ones down. You can see my mitered corner there, here, and it's not as bulky as these guys, okay? Especially if you watched the last episode, we went ahead and used uh, the cotton woven fusible interfacing to make it a little bit more crisp on the back so I wouldn't have any, uh, you know, too many wrinkles in the fabric. And so it made it even bulkier here because you're doubling up the doubled up fabric already times two, times the two sides that come together on this corner. And so by using this mitering technique, it is both a little bit trickier, more complex. And so my tutorial is always going to be geared towards beginners, okay? So if you find that easy to do, then I would say, you know, give this a try and try it out to miter the corners. So I left one here so that we can do it together, but let me go over the visual of how this works. This is just a mini version, okay? So we have whatever the quilted sandwich is. You can have as many layers as you want here, depending on the product. If you're gonna sandwich a piece of batting and then maybe another piece of that heat reflective fleece underneath it, that would be fine. I went ahead and quilted it kind of like an asterisk. So on the diagonal and then a plus sign on top. And then of course, I cut my background fabric to two inches bigger. The reason I cut it to two inches bigger is so that I have extra one inch here and an extra one inch here extra one inch here and an extra one inch here. And so talking about the one inch hem, that's what I did here is I folded it at the one inch and then also at the half inch. So that's kind of the prep work that you're going to do, okay? Then we want this centered and if everything is cut precisely, 
let me give you a little close-up of this corner because I went ahead and marked it with a pen so you can see the lines that I'm referencing here. Let me grab my pointer tool here. Okay, so we have a fold here at one inch over and we have a fold here at one inch up. Okay, then we have a fold here at half of an inch over and we have another fold here at half of an inch over on each of these sides and you're going to repeat that across all the four sides. So I went in with a pen and drew the intersection so you have kind of this tic-tac-toe here and then from this edge of the fabric to this edge cutting through on the diagonal cutting across the little square that's created here from both folds off of both sides is where we need to cut. So where you see that red line, I'm going to cut, and you can put this on your cutting mat and cut it with a, uh, a rotary cutter, a ruler, or just use scissors is fine. And this is where you're going to cut whoop, for all your corners, okay? This chunk that we just chopped off here is gonna significantly reduce the bulk that we end up with in that corner and have it you know fit nice and fine for us to do the mitered corner then you're going to fold here so across this diagonal similar to where we cut but over to the next intersection there and you're going to fold it and let me see if my iron is already kicked on Yes, Windless Original says game changer to fold the larger seam before folding in the smaller one that gets tucked under. Absolutely. I find that that helps them be a little bit more precise because if you fold under the half of an inch first, you might go three eighths of an inch, you might go out five eighths, a little bit bigger, right, than the half of an inch. And then if you are off on that smaller one, when you go to fold it over to the bigger one inch increment, you oftentimes end up folding more than the one inch. And so if you're more precise with the one inch, it's easier to fold back at the half, if that makes sense. And if you haven't tried it, try it and you'll see what we're talking about okay so we folded that one in there so now of course you can put some pins here you can even hit it with a little bit of spray base and actually I have a little bottle here that's almost running out make sure you do this in a well ventilated area I'm just gonna position this here just to help hold it in place right because we are gonna need to do this same prep work to all four corners so that's where it should be do you see where off the one inch fold, these two edges of my inside little quilted sandwich should be? That is the setup that you want to aim for before you can try to like perfectly match up these mitered corners, okay? So now we had this folded under and I like to fold it actually under the corner. You can decide, you can fold it on top. If it's not too bulky, sometimes it's okay to make it lie flat. Sometimes it gets in the way. Then you're going to fold one and let's go ahead and and start glue basting this stuff down so that as I do each one, each step of it, you can see where it's going to fall flat. And where is my glue? Let's see. Of course, I have so many different glues. Let's grab this. Oh, it's right here in front of my face. I'm gonna use the liquid one just with a couple of dots of this washable Elmer's glue. Any, whatever your favorite fabric safe and washable glue basting uh, product is, it's gonna work fine. So I put a couple there, but I'm gonna put a few dots and I'm not worried about going the whole way since this is just a sample. I just want to show you kind of how I'm prepping each corner. Then you'll know that that's how you want to repeat the steps to do it to all four corners and finish your project off. Now this technique, I think it's important to know, you could do this on a quilt. Okay, you would just need to work out the math. Whoops, let me make sure this stays down. You would just need to work out the math for the backing fabric to make sure that you have at least that one inch on top, bottom, and the two sides. Okay, so we're going to put a couple thingies here. And let's fold this half inch one in first, just so it stays down for us. Did my iron on? Of course it's not. Let me plug it in. <laughs> There's so many cords here plugged up. Okay. So, now let me press this down. It heats up super quick, so that's good. Good. Then we'll do the same thing to the other side. That's the first fold and this guy. And really glue basting, I mean, it helps a ton. If you've never tried it, you're probably like, oh, it seems a little fussy. I'm telling you, it's a game changer to not have to be fussing with every single little bit, you know, as you go. Then that second fold across both sides, because we have tucked in this angled edge here, you'll see that they end up landing. And sometimes it doesn't just like right when you fold it up, end up matching perfectly. This one. I mean, it kind of does. <laughs> I'm just saying. But you can see there that when we fold them in, 
it miters nicely, okay? Then again, if I wanted to top stitch this all by machine, I would definitely glue base this down so that I would have all my miters nice and perfect and I can just go and top stitch straight away at the sewing machine. Okay, make sure you have your iron, use it. And if you have a wooden tailor's clapper, use that too, because that's definitely gonna help you set it. Thank you, Marielle. She says, love all your tips and tutorials. You explain everything perfectly. I try, try to pick my words good so that they make sense to the most people. So there you go, a little mitered corner right there, okay? And it's really flat, like it's the same thickness as the rest of the project. It really, really is a great finishing technique. So now, if you were doing this on a larger thing like this, one, I would recommend that you do some good quilting on it because remember, especially if you're incorporating the batting and because we're using that polytherm fleece, I still like to go in and do a good bit of quilting because I don't want to have a big open space of a non-quilted area. Typically, if I'm putting food on something, we know it's going to get dirty. And so I want to be able to pop the finished product into the washing machine and dryer. And so the straight lines that I did here that are not that straight, let me zoom out some, these straight lines are not very straight, but it doesn't matter. I used a red thread and all it's doing is serving the purpose of holding the layers together of fabric, polytherm heat reflective fleece, and then 100% quilting cotton is what I chose to do. You can add more layers or less, right? Depending on what you're planning to do. Okay, so let's come over here and let's finish off this side. Since y'all already know, let me see where my pen is. I don't have a problem marking it flat out with a pen because um, it gets cut away anyways. But I know that's why I chose to do it on a lighter fabric because I know it's tricky sometimes to see on camera. I can see my creases. There's one here at the half inch. There's one here at a one inch. There's one here at the half inch this way, and there's one here at the one inch, okay? So I know, I'm gonna grab my little ruler, and I'm gonna cut right across the diagonal of that tic-tac-toe. Gonna line up my ruler right there. And sometimes you don't end up with a perfect square in the middle of that little tic-tac-toe box. Sometimes it's a little bit of a rectangle, eh, you know. Just try and keep it as accurate as you can. Usually you can fuss with the miter a little bit just to get it to match up nicely. Okay, so now let me scoot this out my way. You would prep, or at least how I would do it, is prep all four corners first, then go in and kind of spray base this in the middle. I'm gonna put a little bit of my basting glue under there so that this fold stays down and doesn't try to pop up on me as I do my other folds to finish it off. Oh, so Mary's asking, she says, you weren't quilting the back fabric as well? I didn't, but you can, okay? What I plan to do is when I come in and machine top stitch this binding into place, that's going to go through all the layers, and then I'll probably go in and maybe over top of any one of these lines, like one, two, and three of them, I don't have to do it over all of them, is stitch over top of it to secure the backing to it, okay? But you don't have to. You know, you can go across it. You can go on the diagonal. It's up to you. I just like to do this after the fact because I can position it a little bit better to make sure that it's perfectly centered if I know that I cut my background fabric really accurately. If you have a walking foot or you want to spray base this to the backing fabric and you know it's not going to move on you, then you can feel free to do it that way too. Or you can even, you know, cut your background fabric a little bit bigger than what you need. And after you quilt through all the layers, then go back in and trim everything flush to the exact size you need to turn under twice and make your corners. There's so many different ways to finish this. You know, it just depends on what you think you're going to be using the project for, how much wear and tear it's going to get. If you're giving it as a gift, you, you're going to want to, you know, kind of foolproof it so the recipient will be able to... Uh, you know, follow some simple care and dry instructions for it. Okay. Let me fold this one under. Basting glue goes a long way. I love it because it's like every fold just gets glued down and it ain't going to come up on me and mess with what I'm trying to do. All right, so now let me refold this. 
I'm gonna give it a press, and this is a tip. I like to fold it first and press it without the glue, okay? It, sometimes it's a little tricky if you start putting glue and then think that you're gonna manipulate it and fold it into place so that when, right when you hit it with the iron, it holds because the glue is there. Sometimes that can backfire on you and you end up gluing it down crooked or off. So I like to pull it over, press it first, then if it looks good, I say, okay, I'm gonna repress right there. And so that makes it so that the fabric doesn't really move on you and you know that wherever you're gonna press it, it already has the memory of having been previously pressed in that area and I know that it's going to stay put. And the bulkier the project, the more that applies. So remember to kind of pre-fold and uh, crease and press it, okay? Janice says, I love the crazy quilting way, but yours looks great. Love the fabric. Thank you. Yeah, the, this print, and I thought about that today. I was like, I bet somebody's going to ask me about this fabric. Don't ask me about this fabric because I pulled it from my stash and I believe I've had it for 10 years. So there's no way that I can track this down. It's an, it's an old Northcott fabric print from the days when I did a, a video tutorial on an advent calendar panel that they had. So now, and I just did this without pre-creasing it, but it's been pre-creased, so it's, I know it's gonna end up going where it needs to go. Right there. And so when it's glued down, oh my, doesn't this make it so much easier? You don't even really need the clips. I put clips there because I haven't glue based it along those sides. So for those of you that don't glue base or you don't have any glue that you can use for this type of a technique, don't worry. Just go ahead and use your clips or you can even put pins, you can put a bunch of them, but you can see the difference. And this is one of the reasons I swear by glue basting. We did this, one of these corners, this corner I think, and I glue basted this whole edge down and I pressed it. That dries the glue, sets it in place, and you can see that I don't have any pins right here. And look how flat it looks. If we contrast this with this edge, do you see how it bubbles open and then there's a clip and then it bubbles open and then there's a clip and it feels like there's a little bit of glue here and that's why this bottom edge is staying down, okay? This right here can be a recipe for a disaster. If you don't have a walking foot, if maybe the presser foot pressure that's coming down onto your fabric layers is a little bit loose, then your machine may not chomp this down tight enough. Or if you have a really tight presser foot uh, pressure, and that means the bite that the, that the foot is putting onto the fabric. If it's too much and you come through with a bulky product project like this, then you also run the risk of this stretching and distorting this because it's not been glued and set into place. So there's a lot of reasons why I like to glue base and it's not just because you know I can be hands-free and not have to use clips. It also dries that glue and sets everything flat so that I don't have to worry about these bubbling areas here. So really, I mean, I, I clipped them like that to show you what else you can do, but I'm gonna go in and glue glue base this whole thing so then I can top stitch it. And this is especially true when you're working with a backing fabric here that doesn't have any type of interfacing, it hasn't been stabilized. You know, I starch my fabrics before I cut them, so that kind of crisps it up a little bit, but not quite as much as having it fully stabilized either with interfacing or with some type of a glue basting technique. So let's put a couple dots under here and repress this. And you don't have to do a full stream, I just kind of go up and down and up and down with my glue. And because the binding is so wide, you don't even have to use the, the fine tip on your glue. But if you have a heavy hand at squeezing, then you definitely want to have one of those. All right. Oh, Mary says, I've never have glue based, but I definitely will. I did buy the clue you suggested. Oh, the glue that I suggested. Yes, there's so many different ones. And I find that I kind of use them all. I just reach for a different one depending on the project. Okay, let's do the same thing on this side, and I already have the red uh, thread in my machine. Now, when it comes to top stitching this, and I'll show you how I set it up at the machine, you could use a variety of specialty feet. There's some that are like um, edge stitching feet that you can get right on the the groove there, stitch right in the ditch of where the fabric meets the top of the quilted sandwich. There's so many different things you can do. Y'all know we're gonna keep it simple because I have my little Juki machine here and I don't really have much in terms of specialty feet for this machine. I don't even have a walking foot for it. So I just use it as is and I never really have an issue. So I'm going to just use the universal foot on it. I have an, a 9014 sewing machine needle in there. It looks like, oops, 
See, this is why I don't glue it before. Because sometimes if you're pressing it and you slide it over and press it, then you end up distorting the binding. I want it crisp right where I want it first, and then I'll come in here and add a little bit of my glue. And a little is really a little. You can't even see it. Another quick tip, say you're making this the day of and you have people coming over in a party and you don't have time to like, maybe you want to hand stitch the binding, you know, this edge at least down or whatever, just glue baste it. And then, you know, <laughs> at a later date, after the people are gone, you can go in there and machine stitch it. But if you're crunched for time, you can just glue baste the whole thing around. Nobody will know and it won't pop off on you unless, of course, it gets wet because <laughs> the glue is washable. So I'm sure many of us have done that before with quilts. I have, I think, a few of my mini quilts hanging on the wall because they don't get wet and they're not used. They're just decorative items where I just, you know, attach the binding on the front, flipped it to the back, and just glue-basted it, and that stays fine. Uh, Sue's asking, how far apart are your lines of the quilted stitches? They're one and a half inches apart. So if you like that, that works. I mean, you can do them closer together or further apart. But let's go ahead and move this iron so I don't burn myself. Clear up some stuff here, here, here. And let's slide the machine over so we can do the top stitching on this. And you'll see how I do it without any type of uh, specialty foot or anything. We're just going straight stitch, and I'm going with a little bit slightly longer straight stitch. Okay, everything here is plugged up. Because I'm going through the bulk and it's top stitching, we don't even need to keep it that short. And this is not really a construction stitch, it's just helping to tack down the backing. So I'm going to go with 3.5, why not? And now I am just positioning my needle about a sixteenth of an inch to the right of where the fabric edge ends, okay? Another thing about glue basting is that if you glue further in here, that mitered corner and that tip are going to stay right, right there where it's at. It's not going to come up on you because um, it's glued down, right? And let me grab my pointer. And even though I'm going to come down here and pivot somewhere here, like right on the diagonal where they meet, and then pivot the other way. Yes, you will be able to kind of get your finger in there, but because it's glued down, even after you wash it, I mean, if you give it a good press, it's going to stay put. It's not going to be flipping up on you, okay? All right, so I'm kind of at a weird angle here, so excuse me. But I just start somewhere. I always want to make sure that I stop my machine with the needle down, and it looks like I'm in the diagonal there. We're going to pivot and come across the other way. And you can see that I don't even have any sewing clips on here. Be careful if you don't glue base because it wants to roll out this way because of the bulk that's inside of there. So glue basting helps with that too. And then of course if it's a thread that blends in, don't worry too much about it being super duper straight. If it's going to blend in as long as it holds everything, you know you're not going to really have any issues. I'm trying to see if my, oh, my bobbin is running low. We're playing bobbin chicken here. Let's see if we win. Oh, I see it wanting to flip on me there. Fix that. It's kind of a tricky angle to sew at, but I'm doing what I can. All right. I'm in the way of <laughs> the camera. I think I'm all right there. This is my way of sewing. This is like what I like. No pins, no clips. I don't have to stop for anything or anyone. I don't have to take anything out. Just stitch it all the way around and down. Okay. And I started over here, so I'm almost done. Last side. Smooth everything out if you see something starting to bubble on you. And then I'm just going to go over my first stitches by a few. And then I'll do like a back stitch and secure. Where am I? Right there. Okay. Let's trim this up. And I always give it a press, even though this is not like a garment or anything. The stitches always, like when it's going through the feed dogs of the machine and the machine is pulling it through and all that, it's going to distort your project no matter what. Like it just doesn't look as good 
as if you give it just a quick press. So it doesn't take long, but grab that iron. Kivia says, I started to buy a placemat from Dollar Tree, but I didn't get it. If you got fabric, <laughs> you already know what to do. This is a good weight too. And if you're just putting food out, you know, if you're hosting or anything and you're just putting food out maybe on the kitchen counter, on the table or something, this is a great way to decorate it and still serve the practical and functional purpose without, you know, having to get a whole thing set up and set out for it. You can use a regular platter or plate and then just decorate the mat that it sits on instead of having to buy whole new stuff. And for me, when I make holiday items and things like this, I wash them and they go right in the bin for next year's holiday. So I'm like, we're not using that for nothing else. I wanna be able to pull everything out next year and have all my stuff set up and ready to go. And the quilting also gives it this nice plush feel too. So it really does make a really cute like home deck item and accessories. And this would be great to give as gifts. Again, you can make this for your table and use them as placemats. If you're giving them as a gift, I think super cute way would be to roll it up you can give it to somebody maybe with wooden spoons or silicone spatulas or something with a little baking kit. I mean, there's so many things that you can do with these types of quick and easy projects. And we eliminated the bulky corners <laughs> and mitered them with that quick and easy technique. So if you're a little bit more advanced and you have more sewing experience, try your hand at doing these mitered corners. And I think you'll really, really like it. Okay. So let me pop into the chat here. Let's see. Janice says it would be great to sew up a bunch of these at the same time and just have them for all the holidays and seasons. And I love that hardwood clapper to set the pressed hem seams. Yes, absolutely. Super fun. And you know what you could do too is I know some people that do this, they'll use like not necessarily a holiday print for the front, but maybe colors that they like to decorate their home with a certain time of the year. And then the background fabric will be a different one. So even though it comes over this side, if they're complementary, at least when you're displaying it with this edge, you'll get a little pop of color there. But then you could also use it like this, okay? And then have it, you know, a, a totally different fabric that's featured on this side for a different time of the year, okay? So, Lots of different ways I think that you could use these. You can set them out with cookie platters, with desserts. I mean, quick and easy gifts, okay? So let me see. Let me make sure I'm not missing anything else in here. Mary says, I think when I bring a dish to a gathering, I will make this and leave it with the hostess. That's the perfect hostess gift uh, to give anyone, really. You bring a dish and there it is, okay? So I hope that y'all enjoyed this little video tutorial. I may do a separate standalone video tutorial for this. If you want to see it, let me know in the comments below so we can consider that. And then I wanted to share with y'all one other thing. I filmed another video tutorial for y'all for my YouTube channel, and it's actually going to air. Can you put them on my, my front camera? Because these are kind of big. Uh, this uh, tutorial airs on my YouTube channel at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time tonight. So these are my little fleece fringe pillows. There's no tying involved. We actually sew these. I know oftentimes when you see fleece projects, because the fabric doesn't fray, it'll always be like, no sew, no sew. We sew. So I like to make it sewn. And we made these super cute little buffalo plaid pillows for decor. My daughter already wants one for her room and her bed. Uh, but I think this is a super quick tutorial. And I think the video tutorial, I'm doing better, y'all at running my mouth a little bit less in each video. This tutorial I wanna say is like six minutes long. It's such a quick and easy project, so if you have fleece and scraps of fleece, you're gonna to wanna to wa watch that one. And if you're not yet subscribed to the Crafty Gemini YouTube channel, definitely check me out. Again, this is a new tutorial that's going live on the Crafty Gemini YouTube channel tonight at 7 p.m. It will go live on there, okay? They're super fun, great gifts. You can sell them at craft fairs and all that. And um, again, to give us gifts, all right. <laughs> Windless Original says, I prefer to sew. Me too, instead of sitting there tying each one of those fringes. And sometimes when you use that technique on these types of fleece and rag quilt type projects like that, they they leave, like you could still see the hole where you tied it. So you'd see the pillow form on the inside. And I don't like that. So if you've made them before and you don't want to try this, that's fine. But if you're looking for a different way to make your fleece fringe pillows, definitely check out my tutorial because I think uh, you may get some little tips that you want to try out. If not on this, even on another future project, okay? All right. 
Well, thank you so much, everybody. Remember that there's a link in the description box below too where you can submit questions for me to consider answering in a future Whip Wednesday episode. I know because it's the holidays, I'm doing a lot of little demos and tutorials and posting stuff like that so y'all can finish up maybe some last minute gifts that you haven't gotten to with the help of those step-by-step -step instructional videos. But you can always ask me questions using that link and that way we can answer or I can answer them on a future episode of Whip Wednesday. So thanks again for tuning in today. Check out the new tutorial that's going live at 7 p.m. tonight, and I will see y'all in the next video.